I just wanted to now uh, thank Derek Willis for, for joining us. Uh, Derek teaches computational journalism at UMD um, and has been at a whole host of places prior to that. Um, he was a news app developer for, for ProPublica. Um, he was a developer and a reporter for the New York Times, database editor for the Washington Post and the Center for Public Integrity, and also is co-founder of openelections.net. Um, so we have a lot that we can learn and then grill him about uh, later today. Um, and with that, Derek, please take it away. Thanks, and, and thanks for having me. I'm really uh, excited to be able to talk to you. Um, I'm, I wish we were uh, you know, at, at, on campus, but uh, we're here. And uh, what will help me do, hopefully, is maybe encourage some more questions out of you. Because, hey, we're a group of journalists, and asking questions is pretty much what we do. So um, I'm hopeful and uh, encouraging you all to just jump in as you, um, as you can and as you want to. Uh, so just to sort of by way of a little bit further explanation from Anne's introduction. Um, so what I do basically is like I interview data, right? And I interview data to find stories and tell stories from them. Uh, and now I teach people how to do that, hopefully. And it's not a super crazy skill in the sense of like, it's very different from what journalists do most of the time anyway, from interviewing people or from reading documents. It's mostly based on formulating good questions and then trying to figure out how to answer them. And what data gives you is the ability to ask multiple questions. You know, if you've ever like reported on the Hill or a state legislature, you know, the difference between interviewing data and interviewing elected officials is data doesn't usually walk away from you or run away from you, depending on the context and refuse to answer your questions. Um, it gives you a chance to ask a bunch of them, uh, which is a nice little thing to have. What I want to talk to you today about uh, about today is uh, using using data in your reporting for accountability purposes. And data journalism is a lot of things, but in many ways, the core of it is accountability journalism, because I think it gives us an opportunity to really test out some theories, to really try to say uh, see if what people are saying to us is what is actually going on. Um, I used to have a pastor who would oftentimes around the time of year where they would ask for, you know, the, the donation drive, the annual stewardship campaign for the church, you know, he would say, don't, don't tell me what you believe. Show me your checkbook or show me your bank statement and I'll tell you what you believe, right? Because like we have, a, we can, people say a lot of things about who they are and what they do. But their actions very often, very often tell us more. And so what I want to do is I want to, uh, I'll, I'll share my screen here in a second. I want to get to essentially this idea about how we can use data to provide some accountability as an accountability mechanism, particularly for the federal government, right? So I want to start out sort of, and here's the, um, start out with my, um, with my rudimentary uh, slideshow skills. You'll notice I'm not a huge designer, but <clears throat> I do, I guess, enough, right? Uh, and, and, and what I wanna talk about is the, the news app that we built at ProPublica surrounding federal government contracting during the COVID, the, especially the initial phase of the coronavirus pandemic, right? And so let's start out with a uh, first lesson of both contracting and uh, governments everywhere, really. Uh, this is often attributed to Winston Churchill. It's unclear to me whether or not he actually said that. We know that Rahm Emanuel definitely said something like this in 2009 during the financial crisis in urging Congress to pass uh, legislation. Um, and, and so the idea here is, the lesson of contracting is, is like, hey, in a crisis, the government is probably going to spend a lot of money. And that's an opportunity it's an opportunity for people who are seeking government contracts who have experience in that area. And it's an opportunity for people seeking government contracts who maybe don't have experience in that area and who are maybe looking to be able to earn some money, whether through good work or bad. Right. And so what we, you know, what, what you get is, is an opportunity to sort of observe a system at work. And you can, 
as a reporter, interview people, and, and you should talk to people about how that system works, especially people inside that system. But oftentimes, individuals inside a system don't have a lot of visibility over the system as a whole, or they have visibility, but their visibility is is influenced by what they do, about the interests they represent, about about sort of the people that they know and the connections that they have. And so what we tried to do, what we sought to do at the outset was try to understand, first of all, what was happening in federal contracting in response to COVID and then where the weaknesses might be, where, where we as journalists could provide some measure of accountability. So the federal government in contracting has um, uh, several, uh, as usual, there's like no one place where you can go for everything for the federal government uh, in contracting data, but there are several places. And one of the things, one of the initial things that, that we went to, to look for um, is this site called SAM.gov, which great, it's our uncle, right? SAM.gov. And I'll, um, I will make sure I'm, okay, I'm sharing that as well. Yes, good, okay. So like, um, SAM.gov offers a lot of things, including uh, reports, different reports on certain types of spending. And so like there's like a report, a cumulative report that they produce about COVID-19 and they, they update it every Monday and Thursday and they have been for the last, you know, well, going on almost two years now. And that's a big old spreadsheet and you can go and download that spreadsheet and take a look at it. And uh, I'm gonna bring up bring up a copy of that spreadsheet and share it with you, so you can take a look at what it what it looks like. Um, I would also encourage you, if you haven't before, to look at like some of these other sort of uh, spreadsheets that Sam.gov puts out in regards, especially to disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, things like that, um, because they will often they often try to gather things in one place. So the question essentially is a good one. How soon after a crisis do these reports come out? Now, the federal government is, you'll be, again, like not surprised to know, is not the most nimble of uh, organizations, but, but it does go pretty quickly in terms of if a particular disaster gets what's known as a na national interest action code, which all of these incidents got, then they actually, that, that makes the system work faster. And so those things do actually show up fairly quickly. The, the weekly reports came out probably within two months uh, of, you know, like, so like maybe late March, early April, 2020, they started to appear, possibly even before that. Let me uh, make this a little bit bigger, hopefully. And what this looks like essentially is, it looks like um, it's a spreadsheet, you know, it's an Excel file, and it has like two sheets on it. It basically says, hey, here's, here's the spending on, federal government spending on COVID, uh, first as a summary by agency or department. And so you can see like almost half the money has been spent by the Department of Defense, which makes a little bit of sense, uh, it makes actually a great deal of success, maybe not at first blush, but considering that the DOD was sort of commandeered in order to make some things happen for pandemic related spending, it makes a lot more sense, HHS about a quarter, then a bunch of other departments, agriculture, which we can get into why that made sense, makes sense, the VA, which definitely makes sense, Homeland Security, Small Business Administration, Department of Energy. So, that's sort of like a summary. And then the second sheet of this uh, file uh, will, when it comes up, what it'll show you essentially is individual contracts. And there are a lot of contracts as the spinning beach ball of uh, gratitude is uh, struggling to pull up. But basically it's individual contracts from within a particular vendor, a particular agency, and then a certain, uh, for a certain need a certain you know, task that they're tasked to perform. One of the problems is, and aside from essentially a, the fact that this file is pretty large now, um, is that like, it's a lot of contracts. If the government's gonna spend like tens of billions of dollars 
maybe even hundreds of billions of dollars on something like that's a lot of spending it's going to be it's going to accumulate over time and it's going to like it's going to be hard for us to like look at in different ways because we're good at looking at certain things we're not good at like finding needles in haystacks as humans like we like to think we are but we're actually pretty bad at it right um and and as journalists you probably are familiar with this whenever you know on those on those occasions if you're like me when you get scooped by someone where something was right in front of you but you just didn't see it you know like yeah yeah i'm just not good at that sort of thing i'm gonna stop this for a second and wait to see how that comes uh when, when that comes up because i want to um, I want to also show you essentially what it looks like when the government, when the government actually, um, sorry, from here, when you want to go and find contracts, individual contracts, you can get a list of them from SAM.gov, but there's this site called the Federal Procurement Data System, and it has a easy search, even says so, right, that you can easily search and of course you have to remove the placeholder text to search things but if i wanted to search something like you know n95 right it would show me essentially a whole bunch of results for that and i could look at each individual one and i could sort like by the date signed and so you can sort of see like Maybe this is okay. So here's like one from 3M that the uh, HHS has a contract with 3M that's ongoing, and we could take a look at that and be like, "Hey, here's a here's a contract that's worth 172 million dollars, or almost 173 million dollars." And this is like an ongoing contract that HHS has. They started it in March of 2020, and it runs through the end of January 2022, this month, basically. And this is just for, it's, if you scroll down here, be like, yep, N95 masks. And periodically they revise and extend this contract so that when the government needs more masks, it just writes another check to 3M for more N95 masks. This isn't the only contract for N95 masks, but like it's a $173 million is a pretty big one as, as these contracts go, right? And so like, this is all pretty standard stuff in the sense of like, you can look at this, you can report out the details on this. It even has like some information on sort of, you know, which particular office within HHS made this contract. It's got contact number for the, for the vendor. Uh, it, tell, it, it will tell you essentially whether or not this contract was um, how it was bid. In this case, it was full and open competition. And some other details about sort of like the nature of contracting, which we had to learn. I had to learn a lot about uh, a couple of years ago when this first started. I didn't, I knew a little bit, but not a lot. What I didn't know, what I didn't know was essentially it was like, what was the most important part of this stuff? And also how to spot interesting contracts, right? Like how to spot interesting things. Uh, There's a question in the chat where Nick asked, do state governments have similar databases for similar databases? And yes, sort of. Like, like they definitely do. The, the degree to which they are searchable and updated quickly is variable. But there's definitely like individual states definitely have contract databases, and you can definitely get access to them in most cases. The, how they're displayed and how like easily you can get at the underlying information varies from place to place. But you know, going back to the to the the FPDS site. Oh, and the advantage. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to get right to this, Madison. But like going back to the FPDS site, the advantage of the FPDS site is that it allows you to do pretty fine grained searches in a way that the SAM database, the SAM site is less good about. Um, SAM does have a search. It is kind of a, like it's an okay search, except that it's guided by all kinds of like menu, it's a menu driven search, which is fine. But whenever you see a menu driven search, you're not in control of that search really. Like they're guiding you toward things. Whereas 
uh, FPDS uh, has a search that actually is pretty useful and actually does have a menu bit, but it has, um, you can definitely, as an advanced search that you can really do a lot with it. You can do all kinds of different, use all, almost any field that's in here and uh, customize the search however you want. The other really big advantage is that you can see over here on the right, I hope, um, is that you can actually get the results of searches in different ways, not just as an HTML page, because I can't share this link with you because it's based on a, it's a session based thing, like it's not a permanent link. And so every time I, I couldn't like pass it around the newsroom, I basically have to say, go to FPDS search and then download the data. But I can grab the data so I can grab like a CSV file, essentially a spreadsheet of these results. And that will, it will generate one and it'll say like, hey, do you wanna open that up in Excel? And I'll say, sure, why not? Um, and it'll allow me to look at it and I'll switch over to what that looks like here. Because it's, this is where the data part starts to get, like this is where I started to get annoyed. Because here's the spreadsheet version of, of, of that search result. So it's individual contracts. And I can make this a little bit wider, right? You can see like, it's pretty good information, pretty consistent and standard information, the agency and the office, and then what they're, what they're you know, who they're doing business with and some details there. And so like, it's not like it's, you know, it's about 30 or so pieces of information. But notice, like, once we started looking at this set of data, I was like, oh, this is great. We can just use this data for our all the questions that we want to ask and answer. The problem is, is that the data that's on this spreadsheet is not everything that's on, like, the web page. In other words, if I go to any one of these individual contracts, uh, and view them, the stuff that's on here on this page, like it's much greater than what's actually in the spreadsheet. And so by giving me a CSV, the government has already narrowed down the information I'm, I can get that way, which is super annoying. Um, and there was, you know, like my colleagues heard a fair bit of swearing from me about this because like it's cheating me, right? Like it's like, hey, that's all my information. It's all our information. We should be able to get that. There's one other thing I wanted to show you about this, which was essentially um, that you can also get this in a different way. And we're gonna get back to Zach Fuentes in a second, but the search results on the right here, there's a PDF version, which you should never want because you should never want PDFs as journalists. Uh, there's a CSV version, and then there's something called an Atom version. And let me show you what that looks like. And you first, at first glance, you're probably gonna be like, that looks terrible, Derek, thanks, I hate this. Um, which I get, I understand. But what this is, is this is XML. It's structured data, like a spreadsheet, but it's on the web. And unlike the other URLs uh, associated with the FPDS site, this one is a permalink. In other words, I can give this to somebody else and it'll bring up the same thing. And more, more, even more important, because this is structured data, I can parse this out. I can grab this off the web and then throw it into a database or throw it into a spreadsheet. And it has all of the information that is not in the CSV file. And let me show you sort of the scale of what, like what that means in terms of the scale of it. So um, I'm not gonna turn, try to turn you any of you into um, in programmers in the limited time we have, but we, we used a, a programming language called Ruby in order to just pull in the data and pull in that data and then write it into uh, a database so that we could ask questions of it. But when we did this for the CSV file, that downloaded CSV of those search results that I showed you, like the code to do that is, you know, not that long, relatively speaking. It's like 40 lines of code. 
And that's just because I broke out every field that they offered. Um, and it's not a lot because it only has a certain amount of information. The one where I use the Atom feed, let me get this, it's down here. There we are. The Atom feed one, it's more complicated. It's like part, it was a little bit harder for me to deal with at first, but it offers so much more information, including like whether or not the vendor was African American owned or Hispanic owned or was a female owned small business. It offered all kinds of different, different sort of very fine grained information, whether it was a sole proprietorship or whether it was actually another government entity. Um, like whether or not it was a LLC or, or foreign owned or a nonprofit. Like it's even goes back to essentially what type, if the vendor is a uh, land grant college, what type of land grant, which, which, which legislation establishing land grants uh, universities was it from? Was it from the 1862 legislation or the 1890 or the 1994 one? I mean, it has a huge, like it allows you to break out, for example, from contracting data, like whether or not HBCUs get contracts and how often, right? And so like this is really, really useful and interesting information that the CSV file just didn't have. And so you might be wondering essentially like, like, okay, so like, how do I go from this to actual data? And like I said, like the answer is you, pick a programming language that can read XML. And luckily that's literally any programming language. And if you, and so if you're saying, well, okay, but Derek, I don't know any programming languages. Uh, I would say, yeah, I was like that once too. But think of it this way. You may not know like the specific syntax, but if you can cook, like if you can follow a recipe, you can do programming. Because recipes are basically a set of instructions in a particular syntax that involves a particular set of steps using a particular like set of like definitions, like weights and measurements. And just like with cooking, if you can read and follow instructions and you can practice, you, you'll get better at it. The other really good news about this, this sort of stuff is that you'll be relieved to know that most of the problems that you'll encounter working with data, especially on the internet, uh, have been solved by other people. Uh, thankfully, other smarter people who then you can just borrow your solution, their solutions and adapt them, which is what we did. Um, we, I went looking for somebody who had already worked with this FPDS gov data and found their solution and kind of adapted it to our own needs. And I highly encourage you to do that. What I, the whole reason we wanted to do this, that I wanted to pull in this data and not just have reporters search FPDS, was that we wanted to ask some pretty specific questions that really wanted to get at like stuff that FPDS wouldn't let us ask. One of those was essentially, can we tell when a person or a organization has received a contract who had never gotten one before. In other words, brand new contractors, because there's nothing in here, there's nothing in the search forms or anything like that, that says, that tells you like, is a new contractor. And so we would have to kind of figure that out on our own. But the way to figure that out is to see if essentially their name or their organization showed up in FPDS previously. And so when we would pull in, when we would pull in the data about contracts, we would also search, do another search, get the results back as XML, check to see, oh, hey, does this, per does this person or organization have another, uh, have any other contracts or had any contracts prior to the pandemic? And if not, if there weren't any results, we'd be like, okay, well, then we're going to consider them a new contractor. And what we would do is we would add that into our data set. And once we did that, 
my next step was to give our reporters, my colleagues, a chance to actually go and look at this information in a way that would be easy for them and that they could find stories with. So for example, uh, what I did was, and actually I'm gonna start over here for a second. Um, I set up this uh, searchable, another's like, so I built like a, a small version of FPDS, uh, but like I built it in a specific way that would help us do what we wanted to do. Um, and so this is a, um, this is a, a using a, a, a tool called Dataset, and Dataset is a nice little um, program. Here, let me go to the official website. It is a open source tool for exploring and publishing data. It's written by a guy who is not, well, briefly was a journalist or worked for a news organization, but basically what he likes to do is he likes to just make data available for people to find, search it, and get answers off of it, out of it. Uh, and if you ever run into Simon Willison, you should thank him for this because it's a great tool because it's free and easy to use. And what it does basically, it says like, hey, um, if for a given contract, uh, it acts like a, or a set of contracts, it just acts like a database that you can then query. If you know how to like a specific syntax called uh, structured query language, you could use that against it, but you could also just say like, hey, I would just like to know, um, you could just use filters and drop down menus and say like, I'd like to know uh, where the vendor name begins with Zach Fuentes. The reason I uh, bring up Zach Fuentes is that he was a, well, he was a guy who we were interested in because he was a new contractor and he happened to work in the White House. And so let me actually go back to this for a second here. And oops, this, ah. So, uh, so he was a former deputy chief of staff. He uh, left the White House, started up his company called Zach Fuentes LLC, and then won a uh, $3 million federal contract to supply masks for the Indian Health Service. And the whole reason we knew this, or that we were able to write the story, was that we identified him as being among the new vendors the people who never had a contract before prior to the pandemic and then we you know just saw which contracts he had got and so we literally would essentially we would i would show every day in our slack here's a link to uh, a list of contracts uh, where the contractor is uh new has not had a previous contract and our my colleagues we would just look at that list and go oh, i wonder what that's about and then that's what led to the Zach Fuentes story. You'll be shocked to know that his contract, his company was able to procure masks, but they were not actually medical masks because, uh, and for that reason, the Indian Health Service wasn't able to use them, which shockingly enough, he didn't have any experience in procurement. And it was during a pandemic when everyone was trying to buy masks and it didn't work out very well. So, what we're what we were trying to do with this with our data set here um, of contracts is we were trying to set up this data in a way that makes it searchable to answer the questions that we wanted to answer. And so we had to really think about like, okay, well, what questions do we want to answer? All of this comes back to what's a good question and what can we say about this information? And so we were brainstorming about like what, you know, con federal contracting is a huge issue. The pandemic was a huge issue. Like how can we tell stories in this particular subset, like accountability stories about what's going on with contracting. And one of the things we started focusing on was new, new contractors. And then once we went, once we found like Fuentes, we we're like, well, there's gotta be other people like that. And there were, 300 you know like by like late may of 2020 we had found like 300 or so first-time contractors uh who had earned contracts worth close to two billion dollars and all we did was grab that data check to see who was a previous contractor and who wasn't and then add up what they had gotten 
in contracts for the for the folks who were new and there were a lot of crazy like it was a lot of like really extraordinary circumstances um, that we found many of them like i said with no experience in federal contracting many of them no experience in in sort of health or ppe related businesses and you know like the question i got oftentimes from from folks in other newsrooms was how did you do the first time federal contractor thing because like that's not in the data and like we had to sort of figure out okay we want to be able to do this what how can we how can we how can we answer that question and then can we make it a core part of what we're doing in in our data all the time in other words like not to do it as a one off but to do it as a um, a regular part of our daily processes which brings me actually back to the, the you know I just want to reinforce this again like that I, I talked to a lot of folks who did work with contracting data during the pandemic and most of them would use the tools that the federal government had supplied like the fpds search without thinking like how could we make this better and so if you're if you find yourself like going back to a site and or doing anything that's manually repetitive with a computer there's a better way to do it because computers are built to sort of automate tasks that's what they're designed to do and what we did was after we got tired of like searching for things repeatedly we wanted we built a system that enabled us to like for it to tell us the answers to questions that we had without us having to ask them over and over and over again if that makes sense and so our, our really our first step was trying to figure out what we wanted to ask of the data put it in a format we could ask those questions easily and often and then just go get the stories from there any questions so far about sort of how we did this or what we were thinking going in through this or problems that we any you know like anything you see like like would have been like problematic or or why we why we chose to make some of the decisions we did okay so the more the more that you load and look at data the better you understand it right and like that's what i want to also encourage you is like there's a certain balance between i know i said like repetitive tasks uh, with a computer are terrible and they usually are i mean i assume a bunch of you have done data entry and if you have like it's terrible right like nobody i'd be very curious to talk to anybody who's like i really really enjoy data entry work because no one no one does it's like it's the worst right one of the benefits though of looking at data again and again and again is that you come to understand it better and you come to learn what it's not only what its, its limitations are but also what its possibility what possibilities are in there right and so some of the things that we ended up noticing uh, about particular about the contracting data were really like small things but also somewhat useful things so for example I want to actually go back to I'm going to show you like in the contract actions we ended up noticing like I didn't even realize like you know I, I knew so little about federal contracting I didn't realize that like contracts get terminated which of course makes sense because you do a bad job, you fire the contractor, right? And like the federal government has a, a specific wording for terminating a contract. Um, and you can like see, like after a while we started to see this and then we we're like, okay, well, who are these, like how, under what circumstances does a con contract get terminated and what should we start looking at? And our eyes immediately went to like very large amounts that were terminated. And so we ended up writing a story about that particular contract by a, um, by like, I think the best named uh, contractor called Federal Government Experts, which this was just like about the most perfect story we could write about a company that called Federal Government Experts who were uh ended up pleading guilty to fraud 
So like, it's just kind of nuts. But but the terminated contract actions were really set up so that like we could see what you know what was going on there, and oftentimes they would include like descriptions. And they would say like, okay, well, it was, this is what it was supposed to be for. And sometimes it was like termination for the government's convenience, which is different from sort of termination because like they didn't do the job. And so uh, each time we looked at the data, we ended up finding out in more, you know, different things to look at and different ways to go with it. All of this, we were, as we were doing this, all of this was kind of leading to what we were ultimately trying to build here, which was a searchable database for the public, which was everything that we'd done up to this point actually led right into this particular news app, because we ended up using the same process where every day it would, uh, a computer program would go out and search FPDS and retrieve the results and pull that data back in. And then it would load it into a database and every day we would update this database and you would see essentially spending every day of the pandemic. Which is when we learned uh, when we started doing this for the public is when we learned that the Department of Defense uh, does a 90 day like delay in, in reporting for them. Uh, so like def def Defense Department contracts don't show up in, in FPDS for at least 90 days after they're awarded by law. Because uh, at first we were like, where's the defense spending? And there wasn't any. And we're like, oh, well, it comes in later, um, which was a pattern that like flummoxed us for a little while. But then we started like designing our site around like the questions that I think most people would have, like how much did we spend on masks or how much did we spend on ventilators or what kinds of categories did we spend things on or, you know, how many first time vendors or veteran known vendors? And all these are clickable and you can drill down into them. These are all questions and like that's what does guided our design. And so literally we had a, a, a Google Doc that just had like, what are questions we want to ask and answer? And that and the best ones made their way into this app. So I want to um, also talk about essentially this idea of taking those questions and using them for reporting purpose, for reporting purposes. Essentially how one question sort of leads to another, right? So our first one or was about, one of our initial ones was about first time contractors, which led us to like, a lot of them were trying to get to buy PPE, to buy masks and other equipment. And then our question from there was like, okay, well, who makes PPE? Um, and then that turned out to be a really good question because we started counting, we started looking at contracts for masks, especially KN95s. And again, this is early on in the pandemic and realized that like these vendors were like, almost all of them were brand new and the companies that they were contracting, subcontracting with to get KN95s were also like total, almost totally unknown. And so like, it was basically just like a rush to do things. And we were able to get a sense of, to describe that system that I talked about, about what was happening in the rush to buy KN95s, because we, you know, as a country, we're not producing enough N95s. And yeah, we talked to manufacturers of, of masks, but we also like look, went, followed where the data went in terms of who these vendors were and who they were working with as well. And so we got to that point and then we're like, okay, well, we found a particular vendor called VPL and they, uh, VPL Medical, and they had like, they were one of our first time vendors and they had a significant like, sorry, let me grab the number here. Like they had significant contracts for, where's the amount here? Yeah, there we are. Like 14 million, 14 and a half million dollars, almost $15 million in contracts 
for both the uh, HHS and the VA. They're like, that's a pretty big contract. In, in terms of individual contracts for stuff, that was one of the largest. And so we were trying to figure out, well, who is VPL? And as it turns out, it led to this incredibly crazy story about like, like it was just sort of like a, a shell of a company where a guy would just fly around and like try to find masks and supply them. And like, it, like it was, it was a crazy story that we never would have found had we not like started focusing on individual vendors and individual contractors. And so what we would do is we would generate from our queries, from our data, a list of like targets and then just start calling them and, you know, sending them messages. A lot of these guys were in WhatsApp groups that we would just sort of like would try to barge into and be like, hey, so I need some mat, you know, like I'm, I'm interested in talking to people who are looking for masks or for N95s. And like it led to like this really, really bizarre series of really bizarre stories. And in fact, my colleague, uh, Dave McSwain, uh, got, uh, got a book out of it that should be coming out pretty soon. One question leads to another. And the same thing for the terminated contracts led us to federal government experts. And so this is where like, at that point, the data was just sort of, it was updating itself every day, basically. And we were just the beneficiaries of a system that we had put in place to find new contractors to find unusual contracts to find large amounts to find terminated contracts all these categories all these thing questions that we had kind of set for ourselves every day we would get like new answers to and then we would try to run down the most useful or interesting or weirdest angles of these and so it was all of it was built on that original F fpds data information but we had to build it through going through the Atom feed and taking that data into uh, a database and then building our own initial database of it that we could then search and filter in an easier way that everyone could share and see. We could pass these URLs around the newsroom and then let us not only to stories, but to our own database, searchable database that would actually be we thought a little bit more useful than having people search Fitbits because like we could give them a list of first time vendors, whereas Fitbits could not. Uh, we could give them a uh, specific like like individual a look at all the actions on an individual contract where you can get this in FPDS and you can get this in SAM in a certain to a certain extent, but not in the same way not as easy as easy as I would uh, not as easily as we do here. Um, and so we could then also break it out by state or by agency or a couple of different sort of things where you can like look at, hey, why are these, you know, like what's going on here? We had asked about the agricultural marketing service, like the USDA. We were like, what is the USDA spending lots of money for in the middle of a pandemic? And it turns out that's the program the federal government was using to buy food, essentially to keep farmers and produce companies afloat. Like there was, you know, like they, they were using the food to be sure, but like they were like doing like huge purchases of fruits and vegetables in particular throughout 20, 2020 and 2021. And they can, you know, to, to actually help stimulate the economy around uh, food vendors, including like not just fruits, vegetables, but meat, fish, basically you name it. And so like the government continued to purchase lots and lots of this, lots and lots of food at periodic intervals. Sorry if I missed this, but, but from what I understand, if you want to get the uh, first time contractor data, you have to compare like the COVID-19 data set with the historical data yes. so i was curious like how did you get all the historical data for this so um we actually like you can actually get all of the historical data it's like an enormous big honking data set but, but we didn't actually do that what we would do is we would take any particular new vendor like a vendor that we had not seen before 
um, like Zach Fuentes, for example, and we would run them through we would run them through an additional search where we would say, okay, um, let's see like, uh, sorry, like not the award, but like, let me find like the date the contract was signed. And we would say essentially, like we would do something where it'd be like, all the contracts that were prior to January, 2020. And, that's a search that leads no results, yields no results, right? But that's also like, you could also do that search through the Atom feed and get the results back and the results would be nothing. And so if we found like a zero results, no previous, con you know, that would mean no previous contracting records. And then we would then say, okay, if I didn't find any previous contracting records, uh, we would consider them to be having uh, having had no previous contracts. Like I said, you can actually get, you can download like the entire set of data, but it's so enormous that even we at ProPublica at the time were like, yeah, we're not going to do that because we don't like, we don't care about every federal government contractor. We only care about the ones who got COVID related money and whether or not they were previous federal contractors. And so that's what, that's how we did that. And so on that search, how, how far back does that data go to be able to say they had no previous contract? Yeah, so we, we essentially, uh, that goes back in some cases, it, it varies by via agency, but in some cases it goes back to like the late eighties. And so we were pretty, like the way that we described first time vendors was essentially like in the last like, at that point, like, I think we, I think we did the cutoff essentially, like in that, in, in this century, essentially, um, because like it's possible that somebody may have had a contract for something like in, in, that wasn't recorded, or you know was not part of, you know, somehow didn't make it into the database. But, but if they were, if they didn't show up in a search of this, it, it goes back pretty far, and we were pretty confident about that. We. We talked to contracting folks and they're like, yeah, if they're not in there, like you, I would not consider them to be like an experienced federal contractor. I'm wondering like about uh, converting the data to, to the story. So like, so there were 355 uh, first time contractors or, or whatever it was. And then you, you, you guys found this Zach Fuentes, like how, what, what's that process? So um, yeah. So like, I, I think the, what we did was we, we were, searching through like, you know, the, like a version of like this, this data, essentially using this data set. And we would look for the contractors, the, we, I would just show my colleagues, here's a list of, of contracts for vendors who we consider to be first time vendors. And so like, there weren't that many, um, I mean, there weren't that many to begin with that were, who were absolutely like brand new to this. And so, and on a given, any given day, it might be like anywhere from like three to like 20 firms. And so it wasn't a hard list. It like, it wasn't like, oh, we have to, it's going to take us hours to, to like, look at this. We would, I would literally dump that list into Slack and we would look and go, okay, I'll take the top five of these. I'll Google them and see, who the hell, see if we can find out who the hell they are. And then, but very quickly we were like, like Zach Fuentes LLC seems like, I mean, like it just jumped out at us. Cause we were like, that's most government contractors for like large contracts are not a personal name. They are a corporation, right? And then like, you know, we also found somebody who worked on Mike Pence's who, or no, sorry, who was a volunteer on Mike Pence's staff who later on got a contract with the Bureau of Prisons um, because like just by Googling names and, and a lot of these folks like set up websites that were like, we are now a federal government contractor. And it's like, and you could tell like they were new at this. Cause it was like, it's almost like we didn't really know what that meant, but that, the process was essentially dump out a list, take a look at it, divvy it up, Google and see what we found. 
looking at this page, there are a ton of columns and yes. I'm wondering if there's some kind of like data dictionary or another resource you'd recommend to become familiar with this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Essentially, there's a um, there are like especially like in the the the, the it was really frustrating to me as well um initially like the sort of how to, how to figure out what the, all this stuff was um the part of the two things i would suggest one is like we looked at like the actual like results pages on fpds to be like okay that's what this thing is that's what this means if this value lines up there be like okay we did have to do a lot of googling and a lot of like calling people and being like okay so what does it mean when it says like simplified acquisition like we had to read a lot of federal contracting manuals basically and be like what like how, how how should i understand this but luckily like the data max match pretty pretty cleanly exactly what the field names here were and then we could just google the field names like literally a lot of times we, we would do like um you know uh fpds and type of set aside and and the FIPIDs help uh section is actually pretty good it has like a one by one kind of uh thing so you can kind of look at like they actually have like a um they have both like a manual that you could go through that looks about as government publication-y as you would imagine um but i but it was super useful and then also like their that help googling on uh, of help also was useful as well i will say that like in contrast to a lot of federal government agencies the contracting folks like they're pretty good at this because they have so many users who like this is like there are a lot of like mom and pop federal contractors <laughs> and so like they need to have some translation layer that works for almost everybody got it thank you yep i will say that one of the things that we learned like thankfully not too late in the process but kind of late in the process was that what i thought was a uh the procurement identifier what what appears to be like a unique id for a contract uh is sometimes not that uh like sometimes it there are there are essentially like two main types of federal contracts there are contracts where we're like we need something and we're going to go out and solicit bids and buy that service or product and then there are contracts where it's like what we need are pencils and we're going to have like an ongoing contract an ongoing arrangement with an agency or a business and every time we need pencils we're just going to be like hey give us some more pencils and here's the money and those those particular types of arrangements are called infinite delivery vehicles which is like a nasa sounds like nasa terminology but basically it's like it's an open-ended contract but it turns out that like the ID systems for those are not the same as for the other kind of contract. And so thankfully we figured out, figured that out uh, before it was too late, like before we launched the site, but like it was within like three or four weeks of launching the site, they were like, oh, huh. The way that I understood this data to be organized is not the way that it is actually organized in terms of what is unique and not. And what is not unique what i'll say is that like what they have done since we since we built the site is they have added uh a unique federal id for each vendor they used to use the they still use like the duns id but that's like a private sort of like the federal government doesn't control duns identifiers but now they have their own like identifiers that come from sam and that's actually uh like i was very glad to see that uh when it pop popped up last fall because it's like that removes a certain level of uncertainty or at least in terms of what the federal government should know about who is a unique vendor and who are, who are related in court you know in part of the same corporation basically 
Um, in addition to that, uh, what what other changes did you see, or what other response did you get from the feds um, from your reporting and from from doing this huge project? So the response was basically, I mean, how to put this kind of uh, charitably? The response from the feds, a lot for large part, was we are doing the best we can, uh, and it's everything is on fire, and this sucks. Uh, I mean, like not officially, but like like we talked to a lot of people who were like like uh, essentially invited us to think about how to spend hundreds of billions of dollars quickly. You ran into like, you ran into the same kind of situation with PPP loan program, right? Which is like, Hey, we've got $800 billion to shove out the door. Let's do that. You know, you could either do that quickly or accurately, but probably not both. Right. Like, you know, and, and what we did see though, that like for a lot of the, early contracts that we reported on where things went wrong, that those folks like those contract contracts got canceled. Uh, some folks went to jail. Uh, and, and, you know, the, I think the, one of the things that we got, you know, that, that we, that we got members of Congress at least to pay attention to was the fact that the certain agencies and, 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 and frankly, for certain kinds of products, folks were way out over their skis in terms of like, it was huge risks that they didn't know what they were getting into. Um, and that got better as the pandemic went along, but like those first like three or four months when the market for like PPE was so distorted and so like it was, I think people inside the industry and to a certain extent, the government knew is it what it knew it was distorted, but not maybe not to the extent that it was. And I think we were able to sort of raise that and highlight that as an issue. How would you rank the various programming languages and things like that in terms of, you know, what's most important to to know if you're. Yeah. So, I mean. <sighs> There are a lot of people on the internet who um, will be happy to engage in like holy wars over my programming language is better than yours. Uh, you should mostly ignore those people. Um, the right, like the, the sort of the broad programming languages that journalists use today, which are some combination of either Python, uh, R, the st statistical language, um, Ruby, JavaScript, might be one or two others, but those are kind of like the big ones. They all can do kinds of the same things. Like they're not, like some of them do certain things better than others, but for the most part, they all do kind of the same stuff. And so the right answer, I think for me, what I tell people is you pick the language that makes the most sense to you. The one that looks most like English to you or whatever your native language might be and say like, okay, I can sort of read this, even if I don't know exactly what's going on, because your ability to do stuff programmatically, and not, I'm not even talking about like making websites here, I'm just talking about like automating tasks, your ability to do that rests on two things. It rests on your ability to comprehend even partially what that, ta like what that code is doing, and on your ability to Google error messages correctly. Like literally that's what program many, like people who actually get paid to write software, what they do a lot of is they spend a lot of time Googling error messages and then going, oh, huh, I should have done that. Or I'll try this. And like, those are professionals. So you, we should do what they do. Like, I'm not gonna get hired by like Google or any other actual software company anytime soon, but I know that's what they do as well. So like, like if you can, like as journalists, like comprehension is kind of a core skill. And I feel like we undersell our own ability to like, to do this, these sorts of things. What I would say is like, if you're interested at all, find a task that you have to do like often enough that it annoys you and try to see if you can automate it. And like auto by automate it, I don't mean like you've now turned it into like, you know, like a, uh, you ask Alexa for it and it just shows up every morning, you know, it comes as a speaker thing. By automated, I mean like maybe instead of a web page, and like setting, instead of checking a web page to see if it's changed, uh, you get an email 
uh, or a Slack message when it changes, uh, or when something shows up in search results, like it will notify you somehow, or it'll like write a line to a uh, to a, a file or add, add a line of data to a CSV file. And so like, what you want to what you want to do is you want to pick a problem that you care about skip like the tutorials essentially i mean not all of them but like it helps to have a, a problem that you want to solve do the tutorials but have a problem in mind that you want to solve and see if you can adapt what you're learning and what you're looking at to that problem you want to solve and like that'll probably help most of all I also highly, yeah, this is a great comp. I highly, highly recommend like the some of the tutorials that IRE has put out. Um, that first Python notebook is a good one. There's like a first web scraper. There's a, you know, like there's all kinds of like first things for journalists that are written for journalists by journalists. And so I would definitely, I would definitely uh, highly recommend that stuff. Great tips. Um, thank you very much um, for sharing all of your expertise and your time. Um, everyone, if we could just give Derek a round of applause. Thank you. And if you have questions uh, or stuff you want to email to me or stuff you're like, I don't want to ask this in front of everyone because either a competitive reasons or I'm, you know, like, I don't even know how to phrase this question. Um, that's totally a legit thing. And you can find me online, lots of different places. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to help, especially now that I'm like non-competitive with everybody. You know, I'm at a university, so we help everybody, right? So promise not to steal your story. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. And um, Derek's email and uh, Twitter handle are in the uh, agenda as well. Um, thanks again, Derek. Yep. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you.